Hey, okay, so some things that we have to talk about still. Um, one of those is uh, just kind of going over uh, neurons and other supporting cells. This is probably a little bit of a review from um, your other anatomy and biology classes. And so we're kind of going to go over it a little at a quicker pace than usual. So, um, but of course, if it's not a review, um, then you have the slides and you can uh, pause the video and take a look at the slides and then you know, resume the video um, at your pace. Okay, so uh, I guess we're off the plan. There we go. Okay, so there's two different types of things we're going to talk about. Like I said earlier, we're going to talk about neurons and supporting cells. Uh, these are also called signaling cells and non-signaling cells. So the signaling cell is the neuron. It's actually going to uh, be something that conducts information. Uh, and then you've got other cells that just help in that process. Uh, and these are these non-signaling cells. Within that group of non-signaling cells, we have, again, two different types uh, of thing. And one is going to be inside the central nervous system, and the other is going to be inside the peripheral nervous system. We have two different types of things going on here. There's a lot more in the central nervous system. Uh, a lot of those are kind of, are you know, like in the brain, helping maintain structure and um, the blood-brain barrier and things like that, things that are not necessarily in the not necessary in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, and that's why we have fewer types of um, helper cells in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so let's take a look at a neuron really quickly. The uh, little kind of spaghetti looking guys on the cell body end of the neuron are the dendrites. Those are what are going to receive input from other neurons. Receive input from other neurons. Uh, or sensory cells. So uh, an interesting thing about sensory cells is they do not necessarily receive input from another. Um, well, I shouldn't say they don't necessarily. They don't receive input from another neuron. A sensory cell is going to uh, get its input from the environment. So we have rhodopsin sensors in the eyes, we have uh, hair cells in the ears. Those are uh, mechanical receptors, so they get pushed and they release um, potassium ions uh, in the eye. Rhodopsin will make contact with a rhodopsin receptor and that's what causes a release um, of neurotransmitter uh, there. The taste buds um, will accept different molecules depending on their makeup, depending on what kind of taste they sense and the reception of the taste molecule there is going to release a neurotransmitter. So these are all different things. These are all, um, they're not receiving input from another neuron. They're receiving input from some sort of physical or chemical uh, contact with the outside world. But this neuron, this is going to be your typical neuron, and it's going to receive input of some sort. So this area over here, the dendrite, is going to receive that input from either uh, another neuron uh, or a sensory neuron or anything like that. So that's the dendrite. We've got the cell body here, uh, which is also called the soma, and the nucleus, which is the center of the cell. This is all review for sure. Uh, the axon out here, this is going to be um, anything that's from about this point on. This is the axon hillock is what this is sometimes called, or the axonal hillock right here. Um, not really important. It's just where it starts to move away from the soma um, before it's truly an axon is just called the, the hillock right here. So then this is all axon. This is coming out to interface with other neurons. Um, this can be fairly long. In fact, we'll talk about that in a second. So that's the axon. Um, action potential travels along the axon. This is your myelin sheath. This poorly drawn <laughs> cells of uh, essentially fat. 
Uh, it's like a fatty substance, the myelin is. And what those do uh, are they help speed the transmission uh, of the uh, action potential along the axon. Um, the spot in between is called the node of Ranvier. And actually, this is really where the transmission is, is sped up. Um, because what essentially happens is, instead of traveling all the way along the axon, what it does is the uh, action potential is going to jump from the hillock to each of these individual nodes of Ranvier. So the myelin's there to insulate um, the axon and allow the electrical current to kind of jump. And so as it jumps, it's actually sped up. It's much faster than just traveling down the axon. Okay, so uh, when we get to the, towards the end of the axon, then you start to have something that, again, kind of looks like a dendrite. Uh, and in fact, it's called the kilodendria. Remember, dendrites are going to um, accept other action potentials, interface with other uh, cells and receive input. But the telodendria down here, they're giving a signal. Um, the actual end of these are called the terminal buttons. This is what's actually interfacing with another cell. Um, it's what releases the neurotransmitter. So a neurotransmitter will kind of be present at the end of this cell. Uh, as the action potential gets down towards the end, then the terminal button opens up and these neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic junction or synaptic cleft. Um, you can sometimes just call it a synapse, but essentially what you've got is the cells don't ever like touch each other. You know, there's not a part of uh, the axon or the, you know, terminal button or the telodendria that sits right up on the dendrite of another cell. There's a gap. So they're kind of just floating near each other. And the space in between, that's called the synapse. So right here, this is the synapse. Um, neurotransmitters are released, and they float over here, and then they're accepted um, by the dendrite of the other cell. Uh, not all of them get there. Some of them float around, and they're um, taken back up by the uh, terminal button. That's called reuptake. You might have heard of uh, something like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And what that does, if you think about it, so reuptake is when the terminal button is taking back in um, the neurotransmitter that it's let out. If it's a reuptake inhibitor, then it's something that's going to not allow the terminal button to do its reuptake procedure. In fact, what happens is um, these drugs hook into the spots in the terminal button where they should be reuptaking, uh, whatever it is. Um, in this case, it's serotonin, and when it's selective, we just say that it doesn't inhibit reuptake in general. It only inhibits the reuptake of serotonin. Uh, so that's essentially what an SSRI is. Um, all right, so that's basically kind of the overview of what your textbook neuron is. Now, of course, we have other kinds of neurons. Um, and we'll talk about those in a second. And then one other thing I just wanted to mention is synapse. You can actually, it's a noun or a verb. So it's the place, like I said, it's, it's this area between the terminal button and the dendrite, that's a synapse. But then you can also have two things synapsing. Uh, so the telodendria synapse on the dendrite of something else. You can use it either way. I'll use it either way. So um, just so you don't get Confused by the terms, it can be used either way. Okay. So, like I said, your textbook definition, um, the textbook neuron that you'll see is this guy right here, the multipolar neuron. Um, it has a whole bunch of dendrites and one single axon. It's the most common neuron in all animals, not just humans, but dogs, um, birds, all sorts of things. The most common also aquatic creatures, uh, squid, you know, all these things, the most common neuron. Um, but it's not the only one. And also, I did want to mention this, that the axons of these can be extremely long. 
So the longest one in humans uh, goes from the sciatic nerve, which is down here at the, you know, the bottom of the spine, to your big toe. Depending on how tall you are, it could be three feet in length. One axon, three feet. Kind of crazy, right? But it gets crazier. Um, <laughs> there are giraffes uh, that will have an area of their uh, spine that, um, let's see. So it's a laryngeal nerve. Obviously, they don't have a larynx like we do. It's not going to be used for speech production or anything like that. But it is uh, very useful in terms of uh, um, swallowing the peristalsis uh, procedure, which is going to contract and allow food to move down their throats with such long throats. Of course, it's something that they need. Um, so they have these extraordinarily long necks. These nerves can be 15 feet. And the dorsal root ganglion in whales can be up to 75 feet. So the, it's a single axon um, that's 75 feet. And that's in a mammal. It's totally ridiculous. Um, again, in ours, the longest is three feet. Very strange. Um, but also amazing, I think. OK, so let's talk about these other cell types really quickly. Um, a unipolar means that there is only dendrites, right? That there's one pole, one type of uh, either send or recept, you know, sender or receiver. Sender isn't really a great word, but you know what I mean. And that's what it means by unipolar. So in that case, it's only got, here you go, you can see this right here. Um, kind of looks like an avocado with a, like a weird stringy body, I guess. Um, it's only got dendrites, which means it is only going to be receiving input, right? Dendrites are where they receive input. So this is kind of only receiving input. Uh, these are not very common. And I think you can probably guess why. Uh, if they've only got receptors, there's not a whole lot of communication that's going on. So, uh, you know, communication is kind of the basis of all of these neural connections. Why would you have a neuron that isn't able to communicate with anything. Well, we're not totally sure um, why they show up so often in insect cortices, but they do. So in the brains of insects, um, I mean, we know what some of them do. I don't. Yeah, you know, I don't study insects, but uh, but the function is known for a lot of them. Um, we're not sure why they show up in such number and not uh, your typical multipolar neuron like we have in other animals, um, but they're there. We have them in our uh, makeup as well, uh, but typically only in the vestibular system. So what's going on here is that they're receiving input from the rest of the vestibular system, and they're help, helping us uh, figure out where we are in space in relation to gravity. Right? So they're taking in all this input from um, the actual vestibular canals, um, a little bit of visual input, some haptic input from the rest of the bodies, and putting this together to create um, the sensation of where you are, of, you know, like spatial awareness. Uh, that's pretty much the only place that they exist in the human body. So um, we will move on. Bipolar neuron. Um, so there you're going to have two different poles. Um, you can see that here. Uh, I should, I want to point out multipolar over here. I mean, you've still only got one axon usually, and you've got many dendrites over here. And it's really the, uh, many dendrites that is pushing that multipolar name because it's still kind of like only two poles, there's still only like, if you think of a positive and a negative, those would be poles. Um, you've just got a whole bunch of uh, negative poles and one positive pole, so it's still considered multipolar. This bipolar neuron here, though, has just one positive and one negative pole. 
Um, there's, you know, multiple small terminal buttons, but it's still really only got the one area of telodendria uh, and then one area of dendrites. So you've got your dendrites here, you've got your telodendria down here. So um, a lot of times what's going on here is this is just changing up what's happening with the senses. So you might have sensory neurons uh, that interface with these. And what happens there is the sense is faint. So maybe two neurons link together at the uh, dendrite of this bipolar neuron, and the bipolar neuron takes in a signal, it changes it in some way, or it integrates those two different senses, and then it shoots out one thing. So these are usually low level um, types of stimuli, areas, uh, you know, pretty far down uh, in our realm of what we're actually processing. So like just interfacing with the body, not even into the brain yet. We're talking um, brainstem level, possibly uh, midbrain uh, pons type areas, but not not cortex. Uh, in the cortex, you'll see something that's like a multipolar neuron. It's a type of multipolar neuron called a pyramidal cell. And there's also some granular cells as well. So anyway, bi bipolar neurons are going to be uh, lower than the cortex, um, brainstem type region. Um, and then last, uh, we'll talk about pseudo unipolar, which actually isn't unipolar. Um, it just looks unipolar. What actually is going on there is that you have axon and dendrites are together, uh, like peanut butter and chocolate, together at last. Um, you uh, will see these a lot in the dorsal root ganglion uh, in the whale, like we talked about, the 75-foot dorsal root ganglion, also uh, in humans. Remember, we talked about dorsal root ganglion earlier, and essentially what it is is uh, the cell that is taking in our sensory input. So it's not the sensory cell itself, but it's the one that interfaces with it. Uh, and it's going to lead into uh, the spinal column. So um, the soma is in the dorsal root ganglion for these pseudo unipolar cells. Um, and it has the one end, the axon and dendrite end in the muscles or the joints or something like that. So it's sensing um, muscular contraction and also sending out information to cause other muscular contractions. So we'll have these um, reflexes that don't really require uh, cognitive input, essentially. Um, and these can be achieved with some of these pseudo unipolar cells. So I can't, I'm not going to get up and, and show you this exactly, but if you imagine that this is your foot um, and you're trying to maintain balance. Let's see if I can get that to look more like a foot. Okay, there we go. So this is your foot. Um, and as you start to lean back, you have pseudo unipolar cells that feel this movement right here. They feel that it's flattening out. And so it sends a signal to the soma, which is in the dorsal, it's a, you know, in the dorsal root ganglion. And it's going to send a signal back to those same muscles that it's you know, sensing a change in that causes them to tense up on the front side. So this side is going to tense up and cause it to come back into your typical alignment, like a foot, uh, an ankle, a leg, and an ankle, and a foot. And if it goes too far the other way, and then you're going to fall forward, which I, looks like I can't actually do with my hand. Oh, there we go. Um, so you're too far forward, so you're going to fall on your face, then back here sends out a signal that says, hey, we're overextended. Um, and then it shoots a signal back down the same, um, you know, axon and dendrite together. So it's going to shoot it back down the same pathway to the same place that it's getting its input from that says straighten up this leg. That's all achieved without getting to uh, the brain in any way. That information doesn't make it to conscious awareness, and yet somehow we're able to stay up straight. You can actually do this um, holding something as well. So if you hold 
a heavy object. So if you hold a heavy object, um, your and you know let, let's say uh, it shifts, the weight shifts slightly. So I'm holding this, and the weight shifts. It doesn't require cognitive thought um, to maintain this, to like shift it back into position and keep it up. So it's the same basic idea. So it this is starting to feel uneven. And so this signal is going to come to my muscle, uh, from the muscle to the soma of a pseudo unipolar cell, which is going to send a signal back and, and self-correct, all without conscious thought. And it's not even with unconscious thought. So I shouldn't say without conscious thought. It's without thought in any way. No conscious thought, no unconscious thought. There's no thought. It's just the... Uh, uh, the neuron making this work. Which gets to what I was talking about a few days ago of, you know, where's the distinction? So this is definitely something that is important for our um, interaction with the world, with our, you know, ability to function, um, but it's outside the brain. So you can't necessarily say that all of our ability to function in the world comes from the brain, from things that we do. This happens outside of any of our abilities to be aware of it. It just happens in the body, essentially. Okay, so the main point that I really want you to take away from this is the major neuron in the body is the multipolar neuron. Uh, we do have some of these others. In fact, if you're going to see a pseudo unipolar um, you're going to have the soma in the dorsal root ganglion, and the axon slash dendrite uh, is going to be out interfacing more with the muscles, more with the world. Okay, let's move on. So pyramidal cells, these are our main neuron that you'll find actually in uh, the cerebrum. It's a multipolar neuron, but it's a special type of multipolar neuron, uh, and it's named after how it looks. Um, you can see that the actual cell body right here is kind of shaped like a pyramid, um, and they're kind of oriented just like this uh, in the brain. So if the cortex, if we're looking at a cortex that is a portion of the cortex that's aligned like let's say it's right here on the top of my head. So the top of that proportion of cortex is going to be up, pointing straight up. Then you have this pyramidal cell, uh, you know, shaped just like this, oriented just like this. Um, if you have a portion where it's in a sulcus and it's starting to move in, the pyramidal cell will be a little bit shifted. Um, but it's still going to point up towards the outside um, of the brain, essentially. Kind of an interesting uh, way that these are laid out. Um, it's usually the largest cell body uh, in any organism that you're looking at. So humans, other animals, dogs, whales, anything like that. Um, fish, uh, also squid anything like that, uh, it's the largest cell body. Now, that doesn't mean it's the largest axon, because actually in squid, the largest axon uh, is the main motor axon that goes uh, from the squid version of the spinal column all the way down to the end of one of its tentacles. These are so big. I mean, they're about the size of my pinky. The axon is the size of my pinky. You can cut these things open, they're, they're, they're dead when you do it, so it's not uh, as gruesome. But you can look inside and uh, actually see the axon. So you can attach electrodes to it and visualize the function uh, of an actual axon. It's one of the easiest ways that we can learn about um, our own nervous system is by looking at uh, these giant squid axons and seeing what they're doing. I mean, of course, we've got microscopes and things that we can actually look at human neurons as well, but um, this is an easy way to get around that. 
So anyway, point there is it's not the largest axon typically. Those are usually motor axons that are the largest, but the pyramidal cell is the largest cell body. And the cell body is really where the work of the cell is happening. Uh, so anything that it's doing to the information uh, that's happening in the cell, integrating information is happening in the cell or um, processing it in some way. I don't want to give you the idea that like the cell is thinking because it's not, um, but anything that's happening to the information is being done there. So it makes sense that the cerebral cell is the largest cell body. You've got the apical dendrite, which is coming up from here, and this one's branching a little bit, you can see, but this is the apical. It's, here's the pyramid, and it's kind of just shooting up right out of the top of there. Apical, you can think of it as like forming an A, and the apical is coming right out. Then you've got basal dendrites, and these are moving out towards the side. So they're coming out of the sides of the pyramid, and they're moving laterally to connect with other pyramidal neurons. Um, again, those are basal dendrites. So apicals going up, basal dendrites are going uh, out. And then you've got an axon, which comes out from the base of the pyramid right here and travels downwards. So remember, dendrites are receiving information. So this, uh, if we're looking at this green one right here, uh, it's receiving information from the top through its apical dendrite, so from things even further up in the cortex than it is it's receiving information. It's receiving a lot of information from its neighboring uh, pyramidal cells, tons of information. In fact, we can have as many as 6,000 dendritic spines. That's kind of the upper limit, but it's not unusual to have a thousand. Um, so there's a thousand different connections for each one of these, moving out laterally, connecting with other pyramidal neurons. Uh, and then an axon, coming down. So that's going to send a signal further down. Um, so now we're getting closer to, you know, activate some sort of, uh, say, a motor response or something like that. If this is in the, maybe the motor cortex, um, it's interfacing with other pyramidal neurons, um, kind of deciding, well, the it's not deciding. Again, I don't want to make it sound like it is thinking, but there's decision happening about how the movement is going to be done. Somehow that's happening with the way that they're connected. Um, and then it's going to fire, the cell's going to fire, and that's going to travel down through the axon, down to a lower level of the cortex um, and kind of set things in motion there. And then one last thing, that's really interesting is the complexity of the pyramidal cell. So how many dendritic spines it has is correlated with its position in the brain. Uh, so as you get further to the front, you have more complex pyramidal cells. And if you remember what we talked about in I think one of the first days of class, um, as information moves towards the front of the brain, it gets more complex. It's more, um, you know, like ethereal, like actual thoughts, concepts, decision making, things like that. So back here is vision, and here is audition, and you know, in here is sensory integration, and our motor strip is here. But as we move towards the front, then we've got emotions, uh, some of the higher level language stuff. And also up there, you expect to see the more complex versions of the pyramidal cells. So we have multiple uh, cerebral layers, um, and we're going to kind of skip over this. This isn't something that we really need to know about, except that um, it is different. I do want to let you know that the layers, the thickness of the layers is different based on where the layers are. So there's six layers almost everywhere, um, not in the olfactory uh, cortex, but that's not really important. So there's usually six layers, but the thickness of those six different layers is different depending on where you are. So if you are near the motor cortex, you're going to have a very thick 
um, pyramidal layer. That's one of the layers. Um, but if you're near a sensory cortex, you have a thick granular layer. It's just talking about the different types of neurons that are in these uh, layers. Um, okay, and that's, that's as far as into it as we're going to go. Uh, oh, this is just pictures of different uh, animals. Uh, so you can see here, this is in the frontal cortex, the parietal cortex, and the occipital cortex for mice, rats. Uh, humans are over here at the side, dogs. Uh, so you can see that there's different thicknesses of the different layers. Uh, some are these kind of whitish ones, some are densely packed blue layers, some are a little bit uh, like large blue layers that are a little bit more intermittent. So you can take a look at that as you like. It's just showing differences in humans and other animals in different parts of the brain uh, for these different layers. Um, yeah, okay, we'll talk quickly about neural connections as well. So um, it is true that neurons usually connect axons to dendrites like we've been talking about, like you learned about in you know, whatever biology or anatomy class you had that this is a review of. Um, those are axodendritic connections, your typical textbook thing. But axons can also connect to weird places. So they can be on the soma. That's an axosomatic connection. Or they could connect to other axons, which is an axoaxonic uh, connection. So, and here's some pictures of this as well. So this is going to be axodendritic. This is your typical thing. So you've got an axon that's connecting to a dendrite, it's synapsing with a dendrite. But you've got apsosomatic, so this isn't touching the dendrite at all. This is going to synapse directly with uh, the body of the cell. Or you can have one where this axon acts on the other axon. <laughs> that, was a, that was a stupid sentence. Um, but essentially what's happening is if this cell is active, it might be interfering with the signal coming from this cell's axon. So if something is making this fire, but this gets a signal that it needs to fire, it can maybe stop the activity of this cell down here, even though it's been told to fire. That's the kind of thing that can happen there. With that in mind, let's think about the different kinds of connections that can make. So you can have things called EPSPs and IPSPs. EPSP just means excitatory postsynaptic potential. Uh, so that means after the synapse um, is the cell excited. And then an IPSP is an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, which can reduce its propensity to fire. So uh, you have EPSP, which is going to make the cell more likely to fire. IPSP, which is going to make it less likely to fire. Um, and that firing that we're talking about is all or nothing. You can't have kind of like a half-assed fire. It's not going to happen. The cell either goes or it doesn't go. It's like a snap. You don't have a partial snap. Um, so you have a lot of EPSPs, and you have just a little bit of a signal so let's say, I mean, we can think about this in terms of like actually uh, behavior, right? So if you say like, hey, listen, do you hear something? Do you hear that? And somebody's going to be listening. They might close their eyes and really try to listen to what's going on. They're setting up a lot of EPSPs. We know this because um, our thresholds for being able to hear stuff uh, change based on our uh, expectations. So if you say, do you hear that high-pitched sound? People are more likely to hear the high-pitched sound than if you say, do you hear that low-pitched sound? Because um, you're paying attention to a different area of sound. So there's um, EPSPs that are at play here. Um, it will make our neurons that fire for high-pitched sounds more likely to fire. Uh, so it takes less information to make the neuron fire if you're expecting a high-pitched sound. If you're expecting a low-pitched sound, you might actually inhibit the firing of the high-pitched sound because you're listening for a low-pitched sound. So if there is a high-pitched sound that's 
happening and you tell somebody it's a low pitch sound, do you hear that really quiet low pitch sound? It might, the expectation that it's a low pitch sound might send out an IPSP uh, to the cells that are responding to the high pitched sound. So that's EPSP and IPSP. Um, that is what is important from this. There's also refractory, period, refractory periods and other things, but those are not on the exam. Uh, so that's the important thing, what we've just gone over. Okay, so we're coming down to our last two uh, slides for this area, and we're just going to talk about these different um, helper cells, these non-signaling cells. Right now we're looking in the central nervous system. I really like astrocytes. I think they're totally cool. So we talked about the blood-brain barrier, and we know that the uh, choroid plexus is the main thing that maintains the blood-brain barrier, right? The blood comes towards the choroid plexus, it gets filtered into cerebrospinal fluid, and that's what bathes the brain. But we also talked about cortical blood flow. So we know that blood needs to be able to serve the brain in some way. It has to be um, oxygenated blood that comes to the brain. Now the blood doesn't directly interface with the brain, no, uh, because then we don't have the blood-brain barrier. Anything that's in the bloodstream can, you know, directly interface with the brain. That's not what we want. So the astrocytes are really what is um, maintaining the other side of the blood-brain barrier. So we have the cerebral blood flow, which we learned about, you know, uh, all the PCA, the ACA, the spider of Willis all these things. That's there and it does serve the brain, but we have to have the astrocytes to help maintain the blood-brain barrier. So what the astrocytes do is all of the nutrients that actually come from the blood, the oxygenated blood, um, anything else that it needs, and, uh, and then there's waste products on the other side, the astrocyte is going to move those, it's gonna exchange those. So it's gonna bring in the oxygenated, uh, well, not, now, not exactly blood, but um, it's going to move any of the other nutrients that aren't exactly blood to the brain that it requires, and it's going to move out waste products to uh, the cerebral blood flow. That's all astrocyte. One other thing it does is that it provides a uh, structure for the cortex, so they're the cortex is actually pretty jelly-like. This is why it needs to be bathed in cerebral spinal fluid to stay afloat. The astrocytes are helping maintain some structure there uh, and connect the brain to the pia mater, which is the lowest, the, the level of the uh, meninges that is right on top of the outside surface of the brain. Um, and so if the cerebral blood flow is coming to the astrocytes, but not interfacing directly with the cells of the brain, then it's possible that what we're measuring when we look at fMRI is actually uh, the work of the astrocytes. fMRI, uh, when we use that, we're looking at changes in cerebral blood flow. And so it's possible that what we're really looking at is the astrocytes doing some sort of work. So any work that the astrocytes are going to be doing is going to cause changes in cerebral blood flow. If they're facilitating communication between neurons, uh, they'll need extra blood flow, and then this would signify that there's something going on in that area. So that would be fMRI uh, having a win. Even if we're looking at um, the astrocyte function, if it's functioning more because of thought going on in that area, then that's okay, that's fine. But um, it also could be that there's something else going on. So uh, maybe the astrocyte is, the, is you know, changing up uh, the nutrients in this area of the brain, not necessarily because any thoughts going on there, but maybe there's some um, waste products, maybe um, the person has undergone <laughs> They're, they're living through a hangover, so there's some uh, 
waste products that need to be removed from the cells, possibly dead um, cells in the brain, something like that, the astrocytes might be doing extra work. So it's possible that not everything that's picked up by fMRI is evidence of uh, thought or any sort of processing in that area. Presumably that would be random activity that's always happening. So it's likely that fMRI is still uh, works and that we are picking up on thought or some sort of cortical processing, even if we're picking up on uh, the activity of the astrocytes. Um, these other things are not necessarily important, um, but what we've talked about with the astrocytes is um, the ogliodendrocyte, which is right here, is actually what helps maintain uh, the myelin sheath for different cells. And when I say different cells, I mean that. Uh, one ogliodendrocyte can support multiple myelin sheaths, and it can support multiple myelin sheaths on one neuron or on multiple neurons. So you can have like this right here, you've got this ogliodendrocyte, which is serving two different neurons, uh, myelin sheaths on two different neurons. Um, there's going to be a component, or a, not a component, a counterpart to the ogliodendrocyte in the peripheral nervous system. So don't get confused with those. The ogliodendrocyte is in the central nervous system and it can serve multiple myelin sheaths. But when we get to the peripheral nervous system, it's not gonna serve multiple cells and it's not in the central nervous system. So watch out for that. Um, the microglia is also at work cleaning things out. So the astrocytes are removing some waste products. So are the microglia. Um, they are also helping maintain the immune system in the cortex. Um, what's really cool about, oh, I didn't put up my, there we go. So here's the microglia. One thing that's really great about these are that they actually attempt to reduce swelling. So if there's any sort of infection, it's not just infection though, it can be from a concussion or any sort of damage, uh, the microglia go to work immediately and try to uh, reduce the amount of swelling. Now that doesn't always work, of course, because we have things like subdural hematomas like we talked about, but um, overall, the microglia are able to take care of small, uh, small damage uh, and it doesn't affect the brain in the adverse ways that it could. And then lastly, we have ependymal cells, which are right here. These are the actual cells of the choroid plexus that uh, filter blood into cerebral spinal fluid. So these are uh, the other cells that maintain the blood-brain barrier. So the choroid plexus maintains the blood-brain barrier, but the ependymal cells are what make up the choroid plexus. So the astrocytes and the choroid plexus maintain blood-brain barrier. Ogliodendrocytes maintain myelin sheath. Microglia help clean up stuff in the brain. Okay, so now let's move out into the peripheral nervous system. We've only got two cell types that you have to remember here. A satellite cell um, is just kind of a protective... Um, layer. And you can think about a satellite cell like a satellite in the sky. It's, you know, outside the earth um, and it's helping, right? So we can think about, um, you know, cell tower, well, not cell towers, but um, cellular satellites that the towers interface with. They help us make calls and things like that. Um, so they're going to completely surround different sensory cells, um, sympathetic nerve cells, uh, partially around parasympathetic nerves. So they're just going to surround nerves and uh, certain types of cells, and they're just protecting them. It's possible, we're not sure about this, but it's possible that these actually might maintain some sort of blood-brain barrier outside of the central nervous system. So it's possible that these satellite cells might be acting sort of like astrocytes, um, but in the peripheral nervous system. And then you have the Schwann cell, which is like the ogliodendrocyte. So it 
makes a myelin sheath, uh, but in the peripheral nervous system. So let's, yeah, okay. The satellite cell is here. It's this one that's hugging this cell. And then the Schwann cell is here, and it's producing a myelin sheath. Now, the one major difference between the Schwann cell and the ogliodendrocyte, which you can see in this picture, is the Schwann cell only creates a single myelin sheath. One node, one sheath uh, per Schwann cell. Ogliodendrocytes can sustain multiple cells. The other thing is that Schwann cells are in the peripheral nervous system. So satellite cells and Schwann cells, they both start with S, are in the peripheral nervous system. Over here, A-O-M-E, no S's, those are in the central nervous system. So if I ask you about a cell and it starts with an S, it's going to be in the peripheral nervous system. If I ask you about astrocytes, ogliodendrocytes, microglia, or ependymal cells, they're in the central nervous system. In fact, what's a good mnemonic device for this? Mo, mo, there's way too many vowels, never mind. Amo, e, emoa. Yeah. I don't know. Mio. No, I don't know. It doesn't really work. There's not a good one. But no S's. Just remember that. Um, if you think of a good mnemonic device here, A-O-M-E, uh, let me know. It might help out your classmates. Um, satellite cells, Schwann cells, peripheral nervous system. Satellite cells surround something. The Schwann cell is the one that's up there. It's a myelin sheath. Okay, and that's all that we're going to talk about in this video.